The White Book by Machiavelli, Chapter 1983, The Drug Years. The message was in the music. It always had been. What was needed was a way to broadcast that message to a wider audience. So when the men in spacesuits arrived with a new technology called music television, the agency devised a plan. Their media magicians combined Hollywood visuals with the sounds of music to create a potion perfect for casting spells on all who viewed it. The quick editing provided them with the perfect canvases for subliminal messaging. They knew all too well that bombarding the senses would overstimulate the brain's receptors and lead to millions of cases of ADD. What they didn't know was that through the safety of television and the comfort of their living rooms, each America would begin to discover the other, and the effects of that reality television is what is presently being uncovered. You could expect their spell to work on those going through life with blinders on, but how'd they reach the skeptics? The ones who needed to look no further than out their windows to see that things weren't quite right. Simple. More science. Media entertained the masses with tales from Neverland. That year's favorite was about an unassuming child star that grown up, recorded the biggest selling album of all time, won multiple Grammy Awards, and had every child begging for his red, zippered, beat it jacket. The kids from one America got the nice leather one, and the others got the cheesy vinyl one. And the next year, when neither one was popular, many parents were happy it turned out that way. But the amazing thing was, Michael Jackson had been crowned king of both Americas. At last, some began to believe that even though we were separate, we were still equal. As for the others, the agency's scientists released a deadlier potion to help weaken the stronger minds. Drop one part crack in the foundation, add one part MTV, and a little glass pipe. Excerpt 23, The Drug Years, page 143. Sweet dreams are made of these. Who am I to disagree? Travel the world in the seven seas. Everybody. Looking for something Some of them want to use you Some of them want to get used by you Some of them want to abuse you Some of them want to be abused Eurythmics, Sweet Dreams Song The Bronx Damn, shit sure is changing Even the music sounds different. It's all electronic now, right? Yeah, but you know all that's going to fade away, said Marion. People are always going to go back to live music, drums and strings. They can't help it. It's in their nature. She and her friend Ego sat in her apartment, smoking cigarettes, watching videos. You right, he said. Give me some George Clinton, maggot brain. can't get with this shit here. Is she a man or a woman? You so silly. That's a woman, laughed Marion. The Eurythmics. Shit. Tell me something. You never know these days. What about that boy George? I swore up and down that was an ugly bitch. Then they put boy George on the screen and I said, God damn. Eggle was really in shock. Time had slipped fast into the future, and he wasn't used to it. For the last seven years, he'd been in and out of jail, a soldier, and one of Nicky's crews. He used to do stick-ups. That's how he got his time and his name. He'd run up on suckers, grab the purse or the bag, and yell, 
Lego. Simple as that. Now he worked in the labs cooking up the new shit on the street. Crack cocaine. Even the elite were getting in on this. Gone was the cheek sexiness of doing white lines. Fiends needed something harder, and hustlers something more practical than powder. By mixing the coke with water, baking soda, and whatever else they wanted, it increased the potency and the profits. Ego continued crumbling herb. What you think about this music television shit, he asked. Motherfuckers ain't gotta listen to music no more. They can watch it. Suddenly, it dawned on him. But we was doing that with acid. I don't know what to think about it, Marion answered. It's nice to see the singers and everything, but I think it's got too much influence on kids. I can barely get Cheris and the boy to go to sleep at night. They know every song that comes on this thing, she frowned. You know... They say, if you want to teach a child something, put it to music. Now, I didn't know that. See there? That's what I always dug about you, girl. You're a natural teacher, a natural speaker. Little bitty woman like yourself hold the whole room captive with no music, just your voice. I remember the first time I saw you. You were speaking to some people over there at the armory on 168th Street. It was Minister Louis Farrakhan speaking. I said a few words but I was just bringing the boy to hear him. He was only a few weeks old then. I told you I remember you, Ego. You was fly. You had on your matching knits and British walkers over there hanging with the thugs. Ego was taken back by the description. He laughed deep this time, choking on the smoke and coughing for a full minute. Marion could tell he was in pain. He grimaced and tried to hide his wide open mouth and missing teeth. You okay? You want some water or something? Yeah, he said between coughs. After he'd calmed down, Marion spoke again. You know you really need to see a doctor. Shit, the doctor can't cure what's ailing me. What did they say was wrong? Ego looked up at her. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a couple of glass vials with a white and slightly yellowed substance inside. That and this, he said, raising his cigarette. They're the reason I'm coughing, but that ain't what's wrong with me. He took another sip of water and leaned back in the chair, waiting for her to answer to his riddle. All right, Ego. I ain't a doctor now. I give up. What is it? What do you got? Ego looked genuinely disappointed. I got a broken spirit, he said. You get that from giving up, so I don't ever want to hear you say that again. Shit. He took out a small glass pipe and opened a vial. That ain't the Marion I know. I seen you hold your own with every man in the movement. You was just as good or better. You a hero. He took a long pull off the pipe, and that sweet, sickening smell of burning cocaine filled the room as he made sounds like he was clearing his sinuses. Marion glimpsed a smiley face in the swirling clouds of smoke that escaped the pipe before Ego sucked them in. What did it get me? What do I have to show for it? She asked as she looked around the room. If it wasn't for you... I couldn't have paid this month's rent. Baby, I ain't no legend. I'm just a country girl. Suddenly, Ego was full of energy. He was louder and speaking quickly. Right. A girl from the country. What? One, two generations from cotton pickers, self-educated, never sold nobody out, just fought hard, kept the faith, and won. You the living, uh... Uh, the living, uh, embodiment of the freedom fighters this country was built on. Marion was flattered. She thought he'd laid it on pretty thick, but figured, it's the thought that counts. Well, look at you, she said. You did time. You didn't sell nobody out. Ego grinned. They never gave me a chance to either. I used to know this by heart, said Marion, but it's been so long since I did any speaking. Let me see if I can remember some of it. Excerpt 24, Chapter 1983, The Drug Years, page 145. Of what fiber can a man be that he offers to risk his life when others stand and tremble? The moral hero is one who stands by the courage of his convictions with whispered innuendo and loss of friends and loss of social approbation 
It is impossible to answer the question of what our heroes made. Even the criminal will at times rise to the occasion. Abandoned wretches in a moment of transfiguration will brave death itself, rescue a human life. It is not the individual altogether, but the inspired moment that accounts for the deed. Perhaps we all are eligible for acts of heroism if the spark comes at the right time to set aglow the impulse. Heroism is not made. Some tragedy finds it out, and, like gold, it is uncovered. Of what fiber can a man be? I tell that to the boy all the time. What it means is that it's never too late. You may still have a role to play. Not everybody is cut out to be the star, but there are all kinds of supporting roles. You fought for freedom when you helped my family out. We love you to death, and that's saying a lot because you know the boy don't like nobody. No, sir, that little boy's got a temper on him. Shorty's going to be a thug. They sat for a while watching the music. So, that was crack, huh? Asked Marion softly. Yep. What's the high like? You don't seem to be going crazy. Talked a lot, but that ain't crazy. Look, Marion, you don't want to fuck with that. I know you tried all the other shit, but this shit is different. Please believe me. It'll take away whatever hope a person has left. I did a line or two every blue moon. I could handle it. Marion got up to grab a bottle and heard keys jingling at the door. Ego cleared the table and she ducked in the kitchen, fanning the fumes as the door opened. Mama, where you at? Oh, what's up, Eggs? The boy loved calling him that. He thought it was funny to be named after food. Where is Ma? What's that smell? He asked, taking off his coat. Nothing, answered Marion before correcting him. And it's, where are you? Why are you home from school so early? You've been fighting again? Nah, Ma, listen. I'm on the playground at lunch, and here come these white motherfuckers in suits looking at me funny. Okay, watch your mouth. Sorry. The boy could get pretty excited. He was breathing hard and jumping around. So I started walking fast to get off the playground. I got around to the front of the school and they started chasing me. Who were they? They hurt you? Marion and Ego's questions were overlapping. Both were ready to hear what came next. The boy knew he had a story and decided to build tension, like he'd learned in his drama class where his instructor said, he's so gifted at relaying emotions. Agents, said the boy relaxed. Marion and Ego asked the five W's. Nan one said their names, answered the boy. They just showed me their badges and said, We're federal agents. We just want to ask you a few questions. That's all. So they walked me over to their car. I sat sideways in the front seat with the door open. Then they told me my name and they told me your name. They called you some dirty names. Punk bitches. Oops, sorry. Then they said they weren't looking for you. They were looking for Yosef. He's wanted for robbing a bank somewhere in Arizona. What? Now that's gangsta. Mr. yelled Ego. Marion put her face in her hands and sighed. What else did they say? They said they know he's somewhere in Mexico. Then they tried to make out like we knew where he was. I told them we ain't heard from him. Then they started asking where you were and did we still live at the old address in Harlem. I lied. Then the bell rang and I said, can I go back to school now? Y'all messing with my education. That's when they started laughing and said, Sure, we'll see you again soon. Then I said, Not if I see you first. And I ran in the front door and came out the back. I made sure they didn't follow me. Ego grabbed the boy and gave him a pound and a few dollars. This my son right here, he yelled. My son, fuck the police. The boy's story explained a lot. Marion was relieved to know that Yosef was still alive. Cheris was constantly asking about her father. At least now, she didn't have to feel like a total liar when she told her that he was fine. She hadn't heard from him since receiving the big money transfer that they'd used to move into this new apartment. Now the agents were closing in. Soon, they'd be forced to move again. Marion was delighted with her son. All her teaching was paying off, and obviously, so was the after-school class she'd enrolled them in. He was perfecting his technique for his part in a big production that coming up soon. You did well today, but you need to stop all that cursing. Calm down and get some rest before rehearsal. He looked upset. He wanted to go outside. Marion opened her arms for a hug. Now, whose little old angry man are you? She asked mockingly. The boy laughed. 
Aw, golly, mama. QB. The days were getting shorter. Autumn had set in. The leaves had turned brown, and the sky stayed a hazy shade of gray, like heroin. Kids were trying to catch the last bit of recreational time before their winter sentences. Nobody was home at the Ali house. Fatima was at the school late, as usual, and Sirius was somewhere playing the streets. The boys had been locked down in Bill's room doing homework. Now, he and his little brother Merlin were begging to get out. Mama, come on. We're going to stay right in front, I promise. Yeah, Miss Drew, said Malik. My mama said it was okay if you said so. Please, can we go out? Added Bagheera. Did y'all finish that homework? Sheila asked, warily and half sleep. Her young daughter Gwen had been home with a bad cold that Sheila was catching. Yes, the lie echoed through the house. Right. Y'all stay in the front so Miss Versi could keep an eye on y'all. You hear? Somebody yelled, okay, after the door had slammed closed. The boys pulled on their coats and raced down the stairs into the fall air. Damn, it's cold out here, said Bagheera. It ain't that cold, said Bill's younger brother Merlin. He and Bagheera were the same age. Put your coat on if you cold, Baggy. You know Mama gonna scream if she catch you without it. I ain't putting that big ass coat on. Well, shut up then. Baggy kept quiet, but the coat was big on him. Like most Project Kids, his wardrobe only knew two seasons. Project Kids are the ones wearing the too big, often dirty, and always pass down bubble coats when it's 50 degrees out. Bagheera was wearing Malik's old coat from two years ago. He was skinny, and Malik wasn't, so most of his clothes were a little too big and fit him baggy. The boys wandered out to the middle of the yard, kicking out leaves and bottles while trying to think of something to do. No use going around back. The bigger kids would never let them on the basketball courts. Just as well, it was dangerous back there anyway. Wine heads were across the street harmonizing over a smoking garbage can freezing in their two tight leather jackets and polyurethane and acrylic sweaters. Malik could hear Benny over there, talking his special brand of shit. Let's go over to the 42nd side and see what's up with them, brothers, said Malik. We'll do it quick. You know your mama ain't coming out to look for us. Nah, she might have called Miss Versi's nosy ass and told her to watch us. I ain't getting in no trouble before my birthday, said Bill. True that. Merlin and Baggy began talking about their own birthday wishes and all the things they wanted but didn't get. It wasn't long before they were on Christmas and Santa Claus. Malik and Bill laughed under their breaths at the two rough little kids who still believed a jolly old white man came down Project Chimneys. They tried to tell them the truth once, and their mothers threw them an ass-whooping party that they'd never forget. Each boy took a seat on their bench and watched as cars drove by bumping hits, Candy Girl by New Edition, and Cold Blooded, by who else? But Rick James, bitch! The younger two played That's My Car, while the older two named as many as they could. Three cuties walked past the bench on their way in the building from the corner store. The boys fell in line behind them, trying to get some play. They stopped at the elevator, and Malik went first. Hey, yo, Shakisha, slow up, girl. What do you want, Malik? I gotta take my mama this shortening, she asked with her lips curled. Tasha and Sinitra giggled at Merlin and Baggy, who were in the background pumping the air and licking out their tongues. Uh, you need to get your little brother and teach him some manners. That's just nasty, Shakisha said. Bill punched Merlin and told him to go outside where they started up again. Why you ain't speak to me today in school, Keish? What's the deal with that? I know you heard me. And fuck you, Sinitra, said Bill. You don't ever speak to me no more. You be acting like you all that and shit. Fuck you, Bill. You know what you did, grabbing my booty? Uh-huh. I don't play that shit. I'm a lady. Ah, whatever, said Bill. He'd already felt under her bra last summer on the roof. When are you going to let me get some trim? Tasha was on the heavy side and didn't get much attention. Come on, y'all. Let's go. She was eating a big peppermint pickle. We could take the stairs. Yo fat ass, no, you ain't taking no stairs, yelled Bill, grabbing his crotch. Chill out, big mama, before you get this pickle. Bill, Merlin, and Baggy rolled around on the floor laughing. 
Yo, chill, B, said Malik. The girls cursed at him as Shakisha answered Malik. Speak to you for what? I told you no already. I'm with Glenn. The door to the freight finally opened and the girls walked in. Fish, a 14-year-old clocker, who always kept a little change from slang and weed, walked out. That's I, right, Keisha, said Malik. Be like that. Fish pat him on the back. Malik, I know you ain't trying to get that little cooch. Leave that hoe alone, man. The boys all gave him pounds, and Shakisha shouted, Man, you just mad because you ain't get none. Nay, nay. They all yelled, Fuck you, and their deepest voices echoed throughout the hall. So what's up, Fish? How you living, black man? Getting money with this new shit, he said. Fish flashed about $60 just as two skinny smokers named Pam and Maxine walked past the gate. Together, the two of them made one cold fiend. Hey, baby, give us six nice ones, said Maxine. Fish pulled out the potion. Yo, shorties, go look for Jake. Baggy and Merlin disappeared through the door, and Fish led the customers to the stairwell. They rushed out a minute later, moving way faster than before. Yo, Fish, what's the new shit? asked Malik. You ain't selling weed no more? I already told you, said Bill, as the younger boys came into the stairwell. What you know about this? Fish held out his hand, and Bill smiled as he said, This the new shit, yo. Brothers is getting money off these. They studied the jagged rocks for a moment before he folded it back up. It was dark outside as they walked back to the bench. The shorties were on lookout as Fish broke open a Philly's blunt and rolled it up. Malik and Bill had smoked a few times before. And only the Lord knew what Baggy and Merlin's habits were. Just as Fish was about to spark it, a herd of bodies came rushing off the courts. Fish's big brother, Killer Khan, ran up to the bench. Some lowlifes just drove through the courts talking shit. Fish, go get that out the shoebox. He turned to the others. Y'all shorties go home. We about to be shooting. Fish took a look at the blunt and tossed it to them. That's on me. They thanked him, and ten minutes later, the stairwell was smoky and smelled like piss and weed. The rancid smell of the incinerator overpowered them both. Through it all, the boys giggled as they reminisced. Yo, 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 remember, remember, remember what? Baggy asked his brother. Do you remember? Shut up. Y'all go look out, said Bill. Nah, we want some too, said Merlin. Bill made a fist. Go look out, he yelled before running towards Malik and laughing as he asked, Remember was used to be on the roof making dirt pies and you always put too much water in your shit and it always used to drip? Yeah, Malik said. I remember you put them muddy bowls in the sink and Sheila beat your ass too. Yo, yo, see there? Bill kicked at him. I, I, you started it. Remember you shot that car with that BB gun and was digging in its eyes with that stick? It took a whole bunch of BBs to make it die. Yeah, it did, answered Malik. I wish we had a real Tech 9 like Mr. T on the A-Team. You see that shit the other night? Son, we'd be jumping out spraying up the block, yo. The blunt had gone out and Malik tried relighting it. The younger boys had caught a contact and were shadow boxing, swearing pity on all fools. I pity all your asses, said Sirius, coming up the stairs. Give me that. He took the blunt and sniffed it. What's this? It was quiet as each one looked at the other one. Come on now. I heard y'all all all the way downstairs. Now can't nobody talk? Nothing, Pop. Just a blunt. That's all. Where did you get it? Asked Sirius. From Fish. Who was that? Sirius opened the blunt and made sure that only weed was in it. That's Killer Khan's brother, Mr. Ali, said Bill. Killer Khan? Sirius thought a moment. You mean Leroy from the second floor? Yeah, answered Bill. Bill and Merlin, you two go in the house, and I better not ever catch you smoking. Y'all remember that ass whooping party, don't you? They ran off. Walking to their apartment, Sirius wondered how to handle the situation. How was he going to tell Malik to not smoke weed when he'd seen him do that and worse, all his life. He was glad Fatima wasn't home, 
so he could handle things his way. He asked Bagheera if he'd smoked any. No. All right, go in the front room. I'll talk to you in a minute. And if your mama comes in here, don't you say a thing. Sirius closed the door and said, Okay, Malik, you ain't no little baby, so I'm going to give it to you straight. Listen up. Drugs ain't nothing to play with. They've been around since the beginning of time, and people been using them ever since then, too. Some, like weed, are natural. That means they come from the earth, not some laboratory. They tend to be a little less harmful, but don't let that fool you. You can still get hurt by them. They'll fuck up your heart and your lungs, too. So if they so bad, why do people still use them? Different reasons. Why were you smoking? Malik's head was boggled. His thoughts still in the clouds. Man, why was I smoking? He hunched his shoulders and made that, I don't know, sound. Because everybody else be doing it, he said finally. Like who? Sirius asked. You know what? Don't even matter. Are you a leader or a follower? Do you do things because that's what you want to do? Or because that's what you think it's cool to do? Malik took too long thinking about it. That means you're not ready, said Sirius. Man, you have to have a strong mind when you're out there experimenting with shit. Not only will it change your perception and make you look at the world different, they'll open you up too. Open you up to what? Asked Malik, confused. Different worlds, man. Different worlds and the forces that control them. Doctors like to call them hallucinations. That's when people see things that supposedly ain't there. I know you've seen them dudes outside pushing around shopping carts and shit, talking to themselves and waving at the air. You mean them dudes with no money who live on them dirty old couches under the train tracks with all that garbage? They be sleeping in plastic and eating stuff that we throw away. Well, those are called bums, son. Some people are just lazy motherfuckers. They ain't never had shit and don't want shit. Then you got some who think they gonna get over on the next man for the rest of their lives. They think time is standing still. Them dudes never wake up and realize people is hip to they shit. Sirius stood there a moment. He'd caught a reflection of himself while looking out of his project window and thinking about all the lost souls he'd left behind over the years. He'd come close to being one of them. From the hat on his head to the cigarette in his hand, he was a mirror image of a decade gone by. He thanked Allah for his father's teachings and Fatima's preaching. He'd been doing some shit that he shouldn't have right before he caught the kids. Malik looked on silently at his father, who was deep in thought. Bagheera laughed at the TV in the front room while the aroma of a meatloaf Fatima had left in the oven filled the apartment. The heat was set on hell, and the walls and windows sweating. Outside, people started screaming after a bottle was broken. Malik rushed to the window as Sirius opened it and let the demons in. Malik took a deep breath of the tainted air and looked at his world. Five stories down, young boys in hoods scattered as the police chased them. The playground sprinkled with colored glass from broken bottles and wasted spirits. They looked like jewels in Malik's young mind. He smiled slightly, anxious to get in their midst. The demons had him hallucinating, making the life seem heavenly. Sirius saw his reaction. He sat Malik on the bed and sat next to him. Look, man, these projects are designed to drain our energy and keep us tired. I look out this window sometimes. I don't want to do shit. It's like, what's the use? You gotta want more out of life than this, man. He nudged his son. Anyway, when I was coming up, everybody was doing this shit called acid. LSD, or lysergic acid diethylmind. It fucks with the brain and makes people see all kinds of shit. I remember one brother I used to hang around. He was all in this dude's basement, getting ready to hit the Apollo and shit. You used to go to the Apollo, Pop? Boy, please, my daddy hustled Harlem. 125th Street between 7th and 8th Avenue, two blocks away from that police station that Malcolm and the NOI posted up in front of. That's my second home, man. Anyway, this cat been tripping. That's what they call it when you high on acid. Tripping. For two days. I get down there, looking all flying shit, and this cat throws a whole jug of water in my face, fucked up my threads. The crazy fucker said my face was melting, and he was trying to put it out. Malik lay back on the bed giggling. No joke, said Sirius. 
They say you could have good trips where you see flowers and think everything is good and peaceful or bad ones where you see shit you don't never want to see again. I guess dude was having a bad one. But another thing is you could do that shit one time and somehow it stays in you. It comes back again and again whenever it wants to. That's why you see those folks talking and fanning. Lots of them are still having bad trips. Malik started to say something and Sirius stopped them. Hold on now, let me finish. Then you got some folks who say that they ain't trips at all. They say that some people who hallucinate are really seeing things that we can't see. Other dimensions. They say they can see the spirit world and the spirits know it. So they follow them around, fucking with them. Either way seems fucked up to me. I never thought no high was worth all that, so I never fucked with it. If you ever heard of magic mushrooms or peyote, that's basically the same thing. Only, they're natural. Sirius could see he had Malik's full attention. He shook his head and continued. Now, what's next? Oh, heroin. I know you heard of that. Malik shook his head. Yes. Heroin comes from these little poppy seeds. Like on your hamburger buns. Malik looked at him funny. You could get high from eating hamburger buns? No. You got to do some other things to it. And don't ask, because I don't know. But that's where it comes from. That's where opium comes from. And them eens. Morphine, codeine, all that. They're barbiturates. Downers. They make you feel real woozy and relaxed. Then put you to sleep. Malik jumped in again. That's why the fiends be nodding in sleep all day? Exactly, Sirius said. This is just my opinion. But dope fiends are the ones you got to really look out for. Why? Because they some sneaky little bitches, that's why. Mostly punk motherfuckers who couldn't make it through life because they can't stand pain. And a lot of times, especially where we live, life is painful. So these cats, they escape by shooting junk in their veins and floating all day in their own little fantasy world where it don't hurt no more. Not just that, but when they try to stop, they say it hurts physically too. I mean like somebody's twisting your insides and shit. And they write, it does feel like that. That makes it hard as hell to stop when you know all you got to do is get a fix to make it go away. So they just keep on doing it. And that's what makes them addicts. Why they be all dirty and stinky? Asked Malik frowning. Because they don't care about nothing else but getting that fix. They don't care about how they look or what other people think. I told you, they be in their own world. Plus... These dealers mix it with laxatives to stretch the dope out so they can make more money. Man, I done seen brothers out there noddling in a pile of shit. Flies buzzing in everything. Sirius looked him in the eye and made sure he understood. They black zombies, Leek. Don't ever turn your back on them. Okay, now you got amphetamines, uppers. Some of these are legal, but that doesn't make them right. People use one every day when they drink their coffee. Coffee's got another ean in it. Caffeine. It gets folks all amped up, excited, messes with their nerves, and keeps them awake. If you take too much, you can stop eating, and people say they'll make you hallucinate too. Cocaine fits in this category here. That's what you had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now again, this is only my opinion, but one reason people do this is because they're bored. See, these are stimulants. There are a lot of people walking around in the world with no hope. The life has beaten it out of them. They feel dead. Cocaine makes the person feel something. People say it gives them an edge over the competition and inspires them to think of all kinds of new shit. You ever heard of Albert Einstein? No. You will. He was one of the century's smartest people. He and his people helped make the nukes. And he helped discover those other dimensions I was talking about. He called it the theory of everything. And he said to have used a lot of cocaine. But Pop, if he was so smart, what did he need the edge for? That's like cheating. I guess, if that's how you perceive it, Sirius smiled. And that brings us to Buddha. Cannabis, Chiba, Chronic, Earth, Grass, Green, Hash, Hemp, Herb, Kush, Marijuana, Reefer, Pot, Smoke, THC, Weed and whatever else they're calling it these days. Malik giggled again. 
I guess you already know what it does. Make your eyes big, make your mouth dry, and make you hungry. But it also opens you up. That's why they call it a gateway drug, because it opens the door for all that other stuff. People never did nothing crazy off weed? Asked Malik. Of course they did. Check it out. A long time ago, it was a group of Muslims called the Assassins, or Hashashin. That's Arabic for Hashish Smoker. They used to throw all this herb over burning coals and sit around in tents, just breathing it all in. Then, as they gotten as high as they wanna be, they'd go out and kill their enemies in the name of Allah. Now, they were some crazy dudes. So, like I told you, man, people do drugs for all kinds of reasons. In the front room, Baggy jumped up and ran to the door to greet his mother. Sirius could sense the worry coming from Malik. He knew she wouldn't handle the situation quite like this. But he had one more important question to ask. Hey, Pop, you tried all these things, right? Sirius nodded. How come you never got addicted? Sirius took a deep breath before answering. Well, I told you why I never tried LSD. As for H, I'm a man. I like to think I got a strong mind and can take pain. As for coke, my faith won't allow me to give up hope. And as for weed, Sirius raised an eyebrow and pointed to Malik. That's how I know you ain't ready. Malik smiled, knowing he was lucky to have a father around that he could talk to. Sirius gave him another blessing before leaving the room. Hey, Leek, don't worry. This is between me and you. I owe you one. So relax. That concludes chapter 1983.